ever worked hard for something? I'm like, I'm, I'm talking like really, really worked hard, like maybe to get out of debt. You want to get rid of all of your credit cards. You've jumped on the Dave Ramsey bandwagon. You've gone from eating all of these great meals out at all of these great restaurants to only eating beans and rice, rice and beans in your home. Anybody with me? Anybody tried to work really hard to get out of debt? A couple of you. Maybe, maybe you've worked really hard to get a promotion at work. Uh, you've showed up early. Uh, before anybody else is at the office, you're there and you've stayed late. You're the first one there and the last one to go. You've worked really hard to get this promotion. Maybe for some of you, you've worked really hard to get out of the friend zone with that special someone. Y'all smell what I'm stepping in? You see where I'm headed? Like you, you go out and you're spending time with this this person, this special someone, and you think things are going really, really well, and then she introduces you as, this is my friend. And you're like, nah, boo, we're not just friends, you're my future, okay? Have you worked really hard at something? Maybe you work hard on your marriage, maybe you work hard in school, maybe you work hard on your dreams, maybe, maybe you just can't help yourself to work hard in your life because it's in your DNA. Your, your mom, your dad, your grandparents, they all worked hard and so you've seen that and now you're patterning your life after that. We work hard because uh, we have someone who's depending on us uh, or, or we work hard because we wanna live a certain lifestyle. Maybe it's a luxurious lifestyle that you can do whatever you want and have whatever you want. Maybe it's just a lifestyle where you can afford the price of butter and eggs now, right? We work hard to go on vacations. We work hard to put a roof over our head. We work hard to get things going in our profession or in our business or the business that you, we start. And we work hard to prepare and to write strategy and to launch things. And there are times where the things that we work really hard for come crashing down right in front of us. And can I just say, when you work hard and failure shows up, when, when you work hard and missteps happen, when you work hard and things fall apart and don't work out, that does not mean that God's withholding his best from you. How do I know that? Because it's right here in the Bible. Our God does good in spite of the bad because that's who he is. In Romans chapter 8, as Marnie so eloquently and graciously taught us last week in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. The even better news for us in the gospel is this, that God works for us even when we haven't been working for him. That's the gospel. We think because we work so hard in every area of our life, we must have to work hard in our spiritual life, in our religious life. And this is especially true for someone who's wired like me. Someone who's a recovering people pleaser. Anybody with me? A recovering perfectionist. Still nobody. A recovering Enneagram number two. Anybody in the house today. This is a... Okay. For the three of us, welcome. <laughs> Especially for those of us who are wired like this, there are just moments in life where I feel like I gotta step up and do something. There are moments where I feel like I gotta fight hard enough, row hard enough, just be good enough so that in one way or another I can be accepted or approved by God. That somehow my approval rating will go up with God, I'll do enough, I'll be enough to where God will just be pleased with me. But if we've seen one thing from this great chapter in Romans, if we've seen one thing in the story and the narrative of Christianity and the life and the teaching of Jesus, it's that we don't have to work for God to love us. That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus did all of the work for us in spite of us so that we would not have to do anything to earn his love. Now, if you're here for the first time and uh, maybe you've shown up over the last few weeks and you caught our generosity series or you're new, uh, I just want to encourage you, I want to challenge you, go back to YouTube, catch up with this series because I have needed the truth from this chapter in scripture. I have needed the reminder of the gospel in my own life that Paul has given us here. 
And so Paul has come to the end of this chapter. He's come to the end of this great treatise to us. And he's going to ask us a series of seven questions. And his understanding is we're going to know how to answer these questions because of what we've seen and experienced all throughout Romans chapter 8. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn over to Romans chapter 8. You can slide on your phone. You can share with a friend. If you don't have any friends, we can be friends, you and I. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, Paul starts with question number one. What then shall we say to these things? What are these things that Paul is saying? What shall we say to these things? What are these things? Paul is talking about everything he's already talked about leading up to this point, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That if you've said yes to Jesus, there is no condemnation for you. We have been adopted as daughters and sons of God. We are no longer slaves of sin. Sure, there may be still moments where we're working through our addictions, where we still struggle in our life, where we still experience the brokenness of the world around us. But Paul says we are no longer slaves, we're no longer shackled, we are no longer locked in and stuck with slavery to sin. Because the Holy Spirit brings resurrection power into the areas of our life that are dry bones. There is resurrection power running through my veins too, Paul says. And because we are now no longer condemned, we can experience life now. The reality is God loves you and God likes you. Each and every one of you, not the ideal you, but the real you, who are you today? So what what then shall we say to these things, Paul says? If we could summarize it in one phrase, if we could boil it down, this entire chapter, into one idea, it's this. God is for us. God is for you. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the king of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords is for you. And somebody needs to hear that today because you've wondered if there's anybody for you, God is for you. Which means for you today, God is on your side. You may need to make this personal and just repeat it back to me. Nobody's going to judge you in this moment. But God is on your side, which means God is on my side. God is in your corner God's got your back. God's longing to see you succeed. He's not waiting around just looking for that moment where you're going to blow it. He's not waiting for the moment where you mess up so that he can condemn you and say, see, I knew they were going to mess it up. That's not our God. God is for you, which may be hard for you to believe because we get so conditioned to see our worth and our value and our identity in what we've worked so hard for and what we've earned. It may be hard for you to believe that God is for you because you didn't grow up in a home of grace and care and unconditional love. It may be hard for you to believe because your faith background was full of stern judgment and constant condemnation. And it felt like God must be against you, but I'm here to tell you that God is, in fact, for you today. How do I know that? Because Paul says it in the truth of Scripture. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, there it is, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, it doesn't matter who's on the other side. What this means is if God is on our team, we will win. It may not be this side of heaven. We may not win. Things may not be perfect and great and all put together immediately, but God's promise is that it will be eventually. If God is on your side, there is no question about the final outcome. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have people who are against us. You with me? It doesn't mean that we won't have things that go against us. We'll have enemies. Some enemies will even show up and claim to be Christians. We get so stuck as Christians and in Christian culture in, you know what, I'm the right kind of Christian. I read the right kind of, of books. I listen to the right podcasts. I, I read the right version of Scripture. I, I vote for the right version of Christian politicians. I'm not stepping in on, on anyone's toes yet. 
So often, as Christians, we end up fighting so much over the little things that we miss the big things that unite us. When we create environments and spaces that we can't disagree in, then we're creating, we're not creating environments focused on growth, they're focused on control. That's why at Mountain View Church, we are always talking about this reality that we value unity over uniformity. Because the trouble is, the opposite is we can get so busy talking about Christianity that we miss following Jesus himself. Listen, it's so hard to carry our cross when we're so busy throwing stones. It is so hard to walk the extra mile when we're stuck in our holy huddles. It is so hard to be salt and light when we never leave our ivory towers. It's so hard to sit at tables when we're so busy flipping tables. The amens have dried up at this point. It's so hard... (laughs) To love our neighbor when we don't even know our neighbor's name. It's so hard to receive from God when we hold so tightly to our grudges. It's so hard to be the hands and feet of Jesus when we're so busy tied up as keyboard warriors. It's so hard to be a friend of sinners when we're too busy demonizing all of them. And Paul, in this moment, reminds us that God is for us. And if God is for us, who could ever be against us? Right out of the gate, this is Paul's question. But then he goes on to question number two, verse 32. He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul here, this this question is saying, if God hasn't refused to give us his only son, what exactly would he refuse to give us? At what point would we expect God to say, nah, man, you're asking too much. I don't know that I can go that far. Think think about it this way. If somebody writes you a check and gives you a gift for $100 million, And then the very next week, you show up and say, hey, could you spot me a hundred bucks? They're probably not going to say in that moment, ah, sorry, man, I'm tapped out, fresh out of resources. No, they've got it and you don't need it. Translation, God's grace has no limits in our life. You're not going to run out of forgiveness from God. You're not going to be the one to stump God. You haven't gone too far. You haven't been gone for too long. You haven't done too much. You have not shock factored God into remission of forgiveness of sins. Paul tells us God will give us all things. But we worry, don't we? We worry when we have less than all things. We worry when we, when we don't land the job. We worry when our stocks aren't soaring, our bank account isn't refilling. We worry when our relationship status never seems to change, when our health doesn't turn, when the depression and anxiety doesn't lift. And we start to worry and we start to even think, well, is God really for me? Is God's hope really for me? Is God's grace run out for me? But what Paul is saying here is not a promise that God's going to grant us three wishes. It's not a promise that he's going to give us everything that we've ever wanted and desired. No, the promise here in Romans 8 is not a promise of plenty. It's a promise of purpose, that God's purpose will be accomplished in your life, that God won't withhold anything that we need to become who he's designed for us to be. God's not going to withhold anything from us in his promises, verse 33 Next question, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Paul is saying here that if God has forgiven us, then nobody can come back and say to us, no, 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 you're you're still under condemnation. No, 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 you're, you're still guilty of that thing that God has forgiven you of. You're still a sinner. You're not worthy. No, Paul is reminding us here that we have been cleared at the highest possible level. Think about the city that you live in. Maybe you live here in San Juan Capistrano. Uh, imagine this, and let me just say, I'm no tax expert, but uh, l- let me just say, if, if San Juan Capistrano has a tax levy on you that says uh, you owe us taxes, 
And then you go to them and say, well, I, I can't pay my taxes. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any more money left. And they would say, okay, we'll forgive you. Maybe San Juan Capistrano, the city could forgive you, but then Orange County could come back around and say, well, they've forgiven you, but the county hadn't forgiven you. You still owe us. But then they could forgive us, and then the state of California could come around and say, well, the city and the county forgave you of those debts, but we're, we're at a higher level here. State of California, you still owe state taxes. But then if you plead and ask for their forgiveness in the state of California, it's like, uh, okay, we'll let your taxes go. That'll be the day. But... <laughs> Stick with me in the classroom, okay? Let's say California forgives you of your taxes, and they're like, yeah, you don't owe us anything. The IRS could still come a-knocking and say, hey, you owe us federal taxes. Now, I have no idea if what I'm saying is even tax code, but you understand what I'm trying to get out here, that, that we have been cleared at the highest level, Paul is showing us, that there's literally no one higher than God, and he has forgiven us and dropped the charges. Amen. That's good news of the gospel. But Paul goes on in verse 34 with the next question. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So if Jesus died and rose to life and is acting on our behalf, who can possibly condemn us? The only one who could condemn us is the one who doesn't, Paul says. So what does this mean for us? What we need to know is that God didn't just drop the charges. He paid the price. This, there, there wasn't just a, a heavenly huddle where, where, where everyone kind of gathered together with, with Jesus and with God and with all the angels, and said, you know what, let's just pretend like they never even sinned. Because that's not just. We have sinned. I have sinned. You have sinned. We have not met the righteous requirements of the law. We have done wrong things, and so we earn death. But Paul shows us here that Jesus is literally running interference for us so that we don't deal with the guilt and the shame. You may condemn yourself, but as far as God is concerned, that's not who you are anymore. You are no longer condemned. Verse 35, next question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? What can ever separate us from the love of Jesus? Paul's going to shift here from the who category to the what category. Because he knows you and I can say, well, well that person, like their family, they're not, going to, they're not going to condemn us. They have to love us. But then we can shift from a who category to a what category because we may think, well, they're not going to condemn us, but, but that, that might because that did happen. That, that did go wrong. I, I did make that choice. But Paul shows us that no one can separate us from Jesus and nothing can separate us from Jesus. Uh, Paul, what, what, about, what about that one time back in 1988? No, no that's not going to separate you from Jesus. Uh, how about that one moment where I totally, nope, that's not going to do it either. There's no one and nothing that can separate us. Nothing you can come up with. And believe me, I know. We can come up with things all the time. Paul gives this list of no trouble, no distress, no persecution, no famine, no nakedness, no danger, no sword. In the first century, this is what they would run up against as Christians. If they followed Jesus, they'd be kicked out of everything. They'd be pushed out of their families, of their careers, of their professions, of their communities, uh, of their positions that they were in. They lost family. They lost friends, their jobs. They were off on their own. If someone in the first century followed Jesus, they lost everything. The government wasn't there with help with med medicine, with help with food. And Paul is saying to them, just like he's saying to us today, you may lose it all. You may be separated from everything, but nothing can ever separate you from the love of Jesus. Following Jesus doesn't mean peace with the world, but it does guarantee victory over the world. I can't stand up here and tell you today 
that when you follow Jesus, the easy life is yours. All your trouble's gone. Everything's gonna be easy. Pain is absent. Depression is gone. No, that, I, I can't tell you that or promise you that. But what I can say is what takes you down will not take you out if you're in Christ. Verse 36. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's this phrase here that Paul uses, more than conquerors, which is found here in Romans chapter 8. And in the Greek, this was a word that described such an incredible victory that it wasn't even a contest. A battle won so decisively, a hyper victory that there was no con- competition. And what Paul is referring to here is this idea that God works in the midst of all things and anything to bring good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Which leads Paul to say in verse 38, for I am sure, I am convinced, Paul says, not, not I hope, not I think things may work out in the end. No, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded, I am sure, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul uses this phrase, this figure of speech called a merism. This is a little bonus for you nerds like me. It's this, it's this phrase that where you talk about a package of things with the most extreme of polar opposites. I've been thinking about it day and night. I've covered the manual from A to Z. Paul could have done just one thing, neither height nor depth, and that would have been sufficient. But he layers upon layers, levels upon levels, in case you didn't get it, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, of God in Christ. No matter what you can think up, no matter what you can come up with, ain't nobody love me like Jesus. This is the doctrine of eternal security. That when we begin a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, it is secure and finalized. We don't have to worry about it going away. We don't have to check off enough boxes, scratch off enough tickets, make sure we don't fail too many times or struggle with sin too long. When God gets you, he's got you. Philippians chapter one, Paul is writing to this church in Philippi. And he says this in verse six, and I am sure of this, the same phrase that he uses in Romans eight, I am confident, I'm persuaded, I am so sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Not he might, not he could, but he will. God's love doesn't just hold us fast, it moves us forward. When God gets you, he's got you. Now, eternal security is not a license to sin. Oh, great, God's got me. I can do whatever I want now. No, it's not a license to sin. It's the confidence to keep going. Why? Because God is for you. Because God likes you. Because God has won the victory for you. Do you know this? Have you experienced this love from Jesus? Have you said yes to Jesus? This morning, we get to celebrate baptism of five of our friends. And when I say celebrate, we, we want this place to go wild, okay? We, we want this place to get lit because of what Jesus has done in all of these people's lives through baptism. But maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized You haven't taken that first step in your relationship with Jesus to say, hey, I want everyone to know that Jesus has changed my life. Let me just tell you, if you're you're here today and you weren't planning on getting baptized, you can still get baptized because we were making plans for you without you knowing it. No, we're not listening to your Alexa devices, I promise. But we are always ready to help you take the step that Jesus is calling you to take. 
So if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you'd like to get baptized, we've got t-shirts, we've got towels, and we got turkey. All right? <clears throat> Maybe you're here and you're a follower of Jesus and you've been baptized. And you're in Christ and resurrection power runs through your veins. Are you living in the confidence that you are not condemned? That nothing can separate you from the love of God and that life can now be leveraged for his purposes, not just yours. Wherever you're at, what is Jesus inviting you to today? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that nothing can separate us from your love. That in the moments when life feels overwhelming, when people raise up against us, when very real, very tangible enemies show up in our lives, we're grateful that you're for us and that no one can ever condemn us because of what Jesus has done for us. And so God, may today be the day that we make this personal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.